Welcome back to the third lecture in the course, Henry George, Karl Marx and their followers, a century of sometimes intense rivalry. Henry George Jr. was already by this time an accomplished journalist. In 1905, he put his investigative and writing skills to work on an analysis of the current state of civilization, a book he titled, the menace of privilege. He concludes with this insight. When employment is made artificially scarce, as the existence of privilege is making it, some of our people must suffer poverty. They must deteriorate physically, mentally, and morally. Then ignorant, unthinking, vicious, volatile mobs must supplant the body of intelligent, upright, self-respecting, patriotic American citizenship. And mobs in great cities, observed Jefferson, add just as much to pure government as sores do to the health of the human body. As privilege extends its control, the forces of deterioration must extend until the whole community will directly or indirectly become infected. The intellectual disagreement between single taxers and socialists was frequently presented in the newsletters, journals, and other publications of the single tax movement. In 1907, John Z. White once again raised the movement's issues for readers of the Single Tax Review. He wrote, Some of our friends think the tenor of our arguments is too emphatically individualistic and that a socialistic flavor would render them more acceptable. Advocates of individualism are not to be confused with socialists, not because each member of the two groups agrees that twice two make four, nor because they are agreed that the state is the proper agency to administer the police power. At the dawn of the 20th century, the industrialist Joseph Fells came to embrace the idea of the single tax and began to devote an increasing portion of his personal fortune to advance the cause. In 1908, after he had moved his family to London, Fells opened a dialogue with leading socialists that continued almost until his death in 1914. Fells hoped the gap between single taxers and socialists could be overcome. He wrote, is there any good and sufficient reason why single taxers and socialists should not work shoulder to shoulder in close alliance for that amelioration of social conditions, for that radical change in the basis of society, which both feel is essential if this world is to become a fit place for the vast majority of its people to live in? This would prove to be an impossible challenge. The British weekly magazine, The New Age, had been reborn in 1907 as a radical weekly, promoting the ideas of Fabian and Guild Socialism. The editors called out Joseph Fells as little more than a defender of his own class interests. It is about time that Mr. Fells was informed that the measure of his mind has been taken by socialists and they are no longer inclined to be taken in by him. Day in, day out, we hear of Mr. Fells popping a letter into this paper and inspiring an article in that, subsidizing a land taxing lecturer here and a land taxing party there, and all with a single object, which he must be very insecure if he conceals from himself. That object is to free his own class, the class of industrial capitalists, from the incubus of rent. Early in 1910, Henry George Jr. embarked on a lecture tour throughout the Midwest and Western United States. In Chicago, he debated with the Marxist A.M. Lewis, who beforehand announced that he intended to annihilate the entire Georgian philosophy. The main problem with the single tax, Lewis argued, was that it would, at most, only divert the plunder now going to the landlord into the pocket of the capitalist, who would then have a double share of surplus value. In response to this and other points made by A.R. Lewis, Henry George Jr. defended the right of those who own capital 
by which he meant capital goods, for a market-determined return for the new tangible wealth made possible by the use of these capital goods. George stated, We learn from Mr. Lewis that the only reason why the capitalist class is able to appropriate surplus value at all is that they own the process of production itself. The landlord is lost sight of or is classed with capitalists but capitalists do not own the process of production, nor the mode of production. They own only capital, and this ownership does not enable them to claim more than current interest. Socialists think that because landless men, driven by necessity, will accept a bare subsistence, therefore ownership of tools always carries with it this monopoly power. I hold here momentarily to clarify that when Henry George Jr. used the term interest, he was doing so consistent with how his father used the term. Interest is that portion of tangible wealth produced that comes from the use of capital goods, that is, by machinery, equipment, and technologies. Not included is the income one receives from cash deposited into a bank or the cash required to be paid to a lender as compensation for the temporary transfer of purchasing power associated with a loan. Standing in 1902 as liberal candidate for a seat in Britain's House of Commons, Francis Nielsen emerged as a leading spokesperson for Henry George's principles. Many other liberals also embraced these same principles. Very quickly, he was regularly addressing capacity audiences on the issues of the day, offering a liberal agenda that challenged both the left and the right. I prepared myself by reading all the conservative leaflets and pamphlets, and also those of the Liberal Party. As for Fabianism and Socialism, I had made a special study of Marx, Engels, Bebel, Sidney Webb, and other Fabian writers even before then. Britain's entry into the First World War brought about a sudden halt to Nielsen's efforts to bring about Henry George's system of political economy for the British people. On a trip to the United States in 1915, Nielsen spoke to members of the Boston City Club on the halting of social progress caused by the war. Because a war is taking place, we radicals don't forget these things, because when the war is over, we shall have to begin all over again. Unfortunately, not where we left off, but perhaps where our grandfathers left off. Take valuation. When the valuation bills were introduced, we were asking the land of the country to be valued for the first time since the reign of William and Mary. Any valuation bill sent to the Lords was promptly rejected. As it turned out, Nielsen resigned his seat in the House of Commons in protest over the conduct of the war, authoring the anti-war chronicle, How Diplomats Make War. He then left Britain for the United States and eventually began to publish The Freeman. Not until 1937 did he again deliver an address in England on the land question and Henry George's principles. As a young man, Sun Yat-sen had read a translation of Henry George's book, Progress and Poverty, and immediately grasped the proposals contained therein as key to the future of China. Interviewed in 1912 by a New York newspaper, his comments displayed a clear understanding of the land problem as it related to China. He stated, the poor land is mostly the possession of poor people in the far back districts. Nothing but the lightest taxes should be levied on them. If the tax were levied on the value of the land, then this injustice would be done away with. If you compare the value of land in Shanghai today with what it was a hundred years ago, it has increased 10,000 fold. There is one point to which we ought to give the greatest attention. Formerly, people owning land pay taxes according to area. In the future, taxes ought to be levied according to the value, not the area of the land.
The valuable land is mostly in the busy parts and is in the possession of wealthy men. To tax them heavily would be no oppression. Now, industry in China is about to be developed. Commerce will advance, and in 50 years' time, we shall see many Shanghais in China. Let us take time by the forelock and make sure the unearned increment of land shall belong to the people and not to private individuals who happen to be the owners of the soil. In Britain, as the 20th century advanced, a growing organized effort was undertaken to continue the political and educational work. The first issue of the publication Land and Liberty appeared in June of 1919 to keep the issues before a reading public. Political support came from the Independent Labor Party, which attracted many former liberals, such as James Dundas White, who explained in an open letter to Ramsay MacDonald why he left the liberals. The taxation of land values was a liberal watchword long before I entered politics, but official liberals have gone back on it. Their pledges were not redeemed when they were in office. Another ex-liberal taking a leading position within the Labor Party was Josiah Wedgwood. In 1925, Wedgwood produced a pamphlet on the taxation and rating of land values published by the Trades Union Congress and the Labor Party. On the surface, this seemed to be an indication that on the land question, Labor had no serious debate with the followers of Henry George. Despite this, nothing substantive or lasting developed legislatively. In an article appearing in the January 1914 issue of The Atlantic, Alvin Saunders Johnson, an economics professor who later was co-founder and the first director of the New School in New York City, also came down hard on single taxers as self-serving. He wrote, the single taxers are, as a rule, members of our dominant middle class. Moreover, their strength is essentially great in that wing of the middle class which is active in molding public opinion, the intellectuals, to borrow an excellent descriptive term from Russian politics. Among the single taxers are to be found writers and educators, members of the legal and medical professions, social workers, and ministers of the gospel. The single tax is then essentially a device for the spoliation of the middle class. In justice to the adherents of that doctrine, however, it must be said that they are not as a rule aware of this fact. Few of them have ever made any effort to ascertain the existing distribution of the property which they seek to confiscate. Those who do recognize the facts of the distribution of landed property hold nevertheless that the gains to society at large will be sufficient to cover all costs. The poor, they urge, will gain what the middle class loses. What Saunders was alluding to was a fact that is even more accurate today than it was in the early 1900s. Household net worth came to most people not from savings or investment in the stock and bond markets or from owning a business, but from the equity that built up from owning a residential property. However, a house is a depreciating asset requiring ongoing maintenance and periodic expenditure of huge sums on systems replacement. What appreciates is the capitalized net location rental value. Single taxers were campaigning to publicly capture this location rental value so that the price of land would fall to very low levels. Ignoring that part of the single tax platform that called for the elimination of all other taxes, Saunders imagined the destruction of middle-class wealth. Then appeared in the May-June 1916 issue of the Single Tax Review, a rather remarkable article by one W.H. Kaufman, a self-described Marxian socialist who tried to make the case that George and Marx had differed not on fundamental ideas, but only in their choice and use of words. Marx and George each used common words in most uncommon senses. Each assumed that the other used words in his peculiar sense, 
Hence, each had, as he thought, good reason for esteeming the other a near fool. Marx taught the fool Georgian single tax a generation before the publication of Progress in Poverty gave a definition of single tax that has never since been equaled for accuracy and conciseness. And also, in some minor matters, Marx is even more radical and consistent than is George himself. In the same issue, single taxer Robert Bruce Brinsmade responded, unconvinced that Mr. Kaufman had accomplished much of anything by the effort. He pointed to the fact that the third volume of Capital was not published until 1893 and attracted little critical attention by Marxists who had already come to their views by the reading of volumes one and two. He added, the few socialist leaders who ever perused Volume 3 of Capital were evidently practical men who did not care to blow up the pedestals on which they were standing by announcing that the political economy of their platforms was a mesh of fallacies and so acknowledged by the founder of their party himself before his death. By the 1920s, public familiarity with the writings of Henry George and with the single tax philosophy had faded quite a bit. In 1925, a printer named Robert Schalkenbach died, leaving a sizable bequest to establish a foundation to keep the writings of Henry George in print and taught in colleges and universities. The foundation sent Walter Fairchild out on the road, visiting the economics departments of colleges and universities. Fairchild's report appeared in the March-April 1929 issue of Land and Freedom. He reported back as follows. The particular matter presented to the heads of the economics departments was the use of the book Significant Paragraphs from Progress and Poverty by Henry George, compiled by Professor Harry Gunnison Brown of the University of Missouri. In every instance, the professors interviewed were familiar with the book and expressed themselves as keenly interested not only in the book, but in the subject as well. In a majority of cases, the professors expressed themselves as favorable to the underlying principles. In only one or two instances was an unfavorable attitude expressed. The general attitude of the teachers of economics in the schools is to avoid any appearance of propaganda and to present the matter as a study of principles. The arguments for and against the proposition are discussed, but it is apparently the desire of the teachers to present our proposition in its purity and to encourage the students to make their own analysis. This is in line with the modern tendency in education, which is to teach the student how to think rather than what to think. Among the academics who continued to look to the works of Henry George for inspiration, Professor Harry Gunnison Brown had strong conventional credentials in economics. He had earned his doctorate at Yale University under Irving Fisher, Fisher made famous in 1929 by predicting that the stock market would continue on its upward path indefinitely. Brown's first published article supporting Henry George's theories was titled The Ethics of Land Value Taxation appearing in the June 1914 issue of the American Economic Review. The article recapitulated all of the arguments made over the previous three decades. One of his observations stands out as worthy of being repeated. The man who, foreseeing a rise in certain land values from a probable increase in or shift of population, puts himself in a strategic position to profit by it is not thereby rendering any service to those from whom he derives return. Foresight used to give a service may earn remuneration. Foresight used to get something for nothing seems hardly deserving of any special protection. A few years later in 1918, Brown's book, The Theory of Earned and Unearned Incomes was published. The book was a strong endorsement of the political economy of Henry George and a strong indictment of the socialist argument against the private ownership of industrial capital goods. In 
ending his chapter on the causes of interest, by which he meant, as did Henry George, the additional tangible wealth that comes from the use of capital goods, he addressed socialist concerns. In concluding this discussion, it may not be amiss to call attention to the fact that the conditions necessary to induce saving might be very different in a socialist society in which private ownership of the means of production was prohibited than in an individualistic society. If saving is to take place in a democratically governed socialistic society, it is necessary that a majority be in favor of it. They must be willing that part of the society's current labor shall be devoted to the production of equipment for future needs, even though the volume of goods available for current consumption is thus lessened. Harry Gunnison Brown was more direct in an article written for publication in the January-February 1920 issue of the Single Tax Review. The protesting masses are likely to be attracted by something which sounds radical, which appears to uproot the whole present scheme of things, but which, in fact, cannot be made to work successfully in the existing state of human nature. They are too likely to be the prey of the demagogue or the fanatic. With a sense of having been unjustly ground down by an economic system which has made others prosperous, they are likely to favor absolute equality of incomes, regardless of differences in efficiency, or to follow a Marxian philosophy and wish to terminate all incomes from property just because they are not labor incomes. Another successful industrialist who came to embrace Henry George's principles was John C. Lincoln. In 1924, he accepted the nomination of the Commonwealth Land Party to be the party's candidate for Vice President of the United States. Campaigning, he did his best to raise the level of discourse to examine fundamental questions of justice. The most important question before the American people today is the just distribution of wealth. The feeling is general that the present distribution of wealth is unjust. The ordinary discussions of the subject assume that there are two factors in the production of wealth, labor and capital. Many who work with their hands believe that they are not getting a fair share of the wealth their labor helps to produce. Many employers believe the only way to increase profits is to decrease the wages paid to their employees. About 1880, there arose a man, Henry George by name who thought this problem through and got the solution. He emphasized the fact that there are three factors in the production and not two, and these three factors are land or natural opportunity, labor and capital. John C. Lincoln had founded the Lincoln Electric Company in 1895 and held over 50 patents on electrical devices. To his credit, he introduced an employee bonus system in the company that made his employees the highest paid in the industry. As the nations of the world experienced economic collapse during the beginning of the 1930s, the political debates and public discourse shifted from the protection of individualism to what new roles government would take on to reestablish some level of economic security and political stability. However, Stalwart members of the single tax Henry George community remain consistent in their teachings and activism. Beginning around 1918, a New Yorker named Frank Shotaroff began writing for the single tax review and became active in the single tax party. When the Henry George School of Social Science was established in 1932, Shotaroff stepped forward to assist its founder, Oscar Geiger, in developing the school's program. Shadaroff, a staunch individualist, took over as director in 1935. With New Deal programs coming online, Shadaroff worried that the nation was drifting into socialism. When the enemy is at the city gates, we turn over all personal rights to a captain, whom we follow blindly even unto death. We are afraid, and so 
with that more hideous enemy, poverty. We fear it so that we readily relinquish the cherished ideas of individual liberty for which thousands of lives have been sacrificed throughout the centuries and look to government to save us from the monster. An empty stomach obstructs reason, and so we have doles and so-called social insurance plans and public works projects and regimentation and more government and more government. And the individual becomes a slave to society. Since society consists of an aggregation of individuals, the slave mentality of the units becomes the mentality of the aggregate. Thus endeth rational civilization. In our country, the dream state of socialism has not yet vitiated our national mind. Some of us are still able to think and act sanely because the control of wealth has not yet been entirely concentrated in a few hands, and we are still able to make a decent living. We are rational not because of the vaunted heritage of individual liberty we are told about by Fourth of July orators, but because the conditions of economic liberty are not entirely wiped out. But unless we learn how and why wealth passes from the many to the few, and unless we stop this unnatural flow by permitting the natural law of the distribution of wealth to operate freely, the American mind will, under pressure of increasing economic slavery, find refuge in the dream state of socialism, just as the European mind already has. As the progressive era supporters of Henry George's systemic reforms died off, an increasing number of new adherents were, as was Frank Chodorov, both anti-monopoly and anti-statist. Extensions and affiliated Henry George schools spread across the United States and into Canada. Course materials were developed in New York to emphasize Henry George's individualism as the path to just societies. Versions of these teaching materials were utilized by schools opened in other countries. The philosopher John Dewey served as the school's honorary president. As the United States fell into the Depression years of the 1930s, Dewey did his best to put before the public the solution he found reading the works of Henry George. In a 1931 paper, he took on the problem of the growing number of unemployed. He wrote, Unemployment is not only recurrent, but chronic. There exists all the time what is known as normal unemployment. Our industrial system is speeded up beyond its power to stand the racking that comes from its own movement. Such a crisis as the present calls attention in a dramatic, even a sensational way to something that exists all the time, but which under ordinary circumstances, most men are too blind to observe. Then in 1932, Dewey delivered the following message over a radio station in New York City. Go to the work of Henry George himself and learn how many of the troubles from which society still suffers and suffers increasingly are due to the fact that a few have monopolized the land and that in consequence they have the power to dictate to others access to the land and to its products, which include water power, electricity, coal, iron, and all minerals, as well as the foods that sustain life. And that they have the power to appropriate to their private use the values that the industry, the civilized order, the very benefactions of others produce. This wrong is at the very basis of our present social and economic chaos, and until it is righted, all steps toward economic recovery may be temporarily helpful, while in the long run useless. In the February 1939 issue of the publication Land and Liberty, Francis C.R. Douglas, a solicitor and dedicated supporter of the single tax movement in Scotland, reminded readers that Karl Marx in the third volume of Capital seemed to echo what Henry George would later write. <laughs> 
It appears that Marx considers that every form of exploitation is based not merely historically, but as a living fact upon land monopoly. This is not a mere chance remark, for the same thing is said over and over again. It is a pity that most of Marx's followers know so little of the contents of these chapters. If they had, they might have appreciated why the first demand of the Communist Manifesto was abolition of property in land and application of all rents of land to public purposes. And so we'll stop here for the end of the third lecture. Thank you.